the battle Illuminati Sends the charity of the ducks Is it Disney mind control? Is this MK Ultra Deluxe? I go Disney Come to shut upon a star I go Disney To no one to chat far I go Disney Pinio Land, Pinocchio I go Disney As a bomb so low Pinocchio seeks fun on Pleasure Island But traffickers need just for the mines Captain Hook the Lost Boy in Neverland Saving kids from Peter Pan's designs Nemo feels to survive the Barracuda and that nobody means no one Snow White never took another breath The Prince, the Angel of Death has come to Disney We go from real to real I go Disney Bohemian Grove and no more feel I go Disney Ask about to learn that day Go Disney, we teach a call to everybody Go Disney, go wish upon a star Go Disney, you know I'm too shall far Go Disney, the new brand Pinocchio Hello, welcome to the Occult Disney Podcast, where we take all sorts of animals, mice and bears and moose, and check out what the slimy underbelly is underneath eh, the occult underbelly. I guess it doesn't have to be slimy. Uh, in the forest it is, though. Hi, this is Matt here, as always. Over there is Thomas. What up? What up? And I like the proper use of moose, one of my favorite animal names, because I believe it's the same singular and plural. There you go. It is. One moose, two moose. Yeah, as an English teacher. Well, the big one is mice, right? Because mice show up a lot in books I want to call and... multiple moose meese. I you so do. badly I do. But, you know, trying to explain to a four-year-old whose first language is Japanese, you know, it's one mouse, two mice, that just, like, breaks their brain. They don't, they it, don't follow that. <laughs> it helps if you start and you teach them MK Ultra first, and then anytime, like, a weird semantic thing comes up, they're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> like, this is just part of the programming. This is part I of you. I can understand two divergent things at the same time. <laughs> right. It's great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's Brother Bear today. Uh I'm going to guess this. This is the period of Disney films, I think, that like nobody's seen them. Like, we're the first person that I've ever seen these movies. <laughs> well, I mean, you usually do the number research. I assume that there was a return on this one, but I mean... If this one's a little bit weird, because um, I'm looking at it. Budget 46. Box Office 250. You're like, oh, that's wildly popular, right? But the, the thing that I guess got it was a uh, domestic was 80, meaning domestically it was a flop, but internationally it was a hit, which is interesting because it's such a, uh, you know, North American setting and stuff. Right. So kind of sort of, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily modern American themed, so it, uh, it has an international feel to it. Yeah. It, it, the setting is like Alaska. Cause it's not 100% clear. I, I think, uh, you know, Pacific Northwest for sure, but you know, specifically well, it is Alaska. I, I mean, I guess we'll just start and get a little bit deep. Cause I, I was trying my best to do some like actual occult research for this and figure out the things that they leave out. And I think based on my, my brief research into this and Disney was very vague about when this takes place, where it takes place, the specific tribe, I guess, of the peoples. But I'm almost positive, and I'm going to butcher the name, but it's called like the, the Tlingits, T-L-I-N-G-I-T, which is the most northern of all the northwestern um, Pacific Coast native Alaskan slash first peoples, because it's kind of a mishmash of those two different groups, right? Because... Uh, the the imperialists came and just split the two uh, up a little bit, but that I guess that's the most one because 
they had a strong shaman thing where the shamans were known to communicate with the spirits and with animals in particular, but also the use of totems, which I guess is not as um, ubiquitous amongst all the different tribes, even in that region. So a couple of those notes, but also it probably took place at least 14,000 years ago because they do show woolly mammoths at some point, right? I'm pretty sure they yeah. show woolly mammoths. Yeah, it, it's supposed to be quite prehistoric. So uh, the date you're saying sounds about right. Um, yeah, while I was watching, of course, I want to start thinking about skinwalkers, but I guess that's a more like a continental state sort of thing. So I, I don't it know if that comes is, in yeah. today or not. Yeah. <laughs> but uh and I hadn't thought about the skinwalkers for a while, so I wanted to think about that. But oh, yeah, like multiple reality shows now. That, that's a side <laughs> tangent for another time. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is basically, it seems like, a response to The Lion King after that was a surprise hit. Because that was supposed to be their B picture, and it ended up being like wildly successful. So I was like, yeah, more of the animal movies. Just put it in North America this time. And it took nine years for that to happen, I guess. So uh, kind of a slow guest station lots of different plot things in here at one point it was going to be since since the lion king was kind of a hamlet uh this was going to be a king lear which you know did not that's not the case now right um the other one just to keep track of our uh our proxy what is the brother's name that dies is that the middle brother's Danahi, the older brother is Sitka. Sitka was uh, originally supposed to be dad, so he would die proxy style and then come back, you know, as a Mufasa ghost, but now it's it's his brother instead. So a uh, slight twist to the proxy, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I don't see why they changed it, to be honest. Uh, I don't either. That would have made sense, although this one does have a unique perspective on the proxy in my mind, and that's that in this movie, we become the person that kills the the IP. Like so, so to restate, the Disney proxy is usually in the first few moments of the movie, they'll kill the main protagonist's parents so that they're orphaned or they're kidnapped or something. They're separated from their only known authority slash parental slash guardian figure. And then the next thing that shows up on the screen is gonna be some Disney mascot, some Disney IP that coincidentally shows up on lunchboxes and t-shirts and happy meal toys right in this one though instead of your instead of your parent dying and then you finding this new disney sidekick now you kill the disney sidekick's parent and you have to kind of like live with this and it's, it's almost disney saying like look what you've made us do right <laughs> like now look you're gonna live cub. through it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you did it no um and a couple things just uh, the, at that point of the movie when uh, he, he becomes a, a bear. Sorry, I should get these names correct. Can I? Can I? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> but I, a couple they Wizard of Oz did just a little bit. So I like that both of them are a little bit subtle. The first one, the aspect ratio changed once um, he becomes a bear. It was kind of Academy standard and then goes full widescreen once he becomes a bear. And uh, the animation itself is a little bit uh, muted and not so cartoonish up to that point. Once he becomes a bear, it becomes like full on, you know, Disney animation. So I thought those are a couple of interesting, subtle production points. And those are, you know, very intentional ones to it. Sometimes we're like, well, it could be an accident in that case. No, of course they made that choice. You know, the, the names themselves, too, are a little bit interesting. And maybe this these are all totally normal names in this region. But the the keen eye just semantically and phonetically right like having a keen eye i just immediately gravitated towards that as being the protagonist's name yeah it's all right mispronounced as can i and i knew i was saying it wrong as it was coming out but yeah keen eye uh coda's easy to keep track of rut and tuk whatever uh denahi am i getting that right and sitka that's that's, that's, that's right that's, yeah Guitar players love Sitka. That's what the tops of <laughs> the acoustics are made out of, right? <laughs> well, if you have a decent one. <laughs> so, yeah, Sit Sitka definitely, even if they make him be the older brother after some iterations of this, he's clearly the one guardian figure followed by that shaman grandma. Or I don't even know if it's necessarily related. Technically, if she's the shaman of the tribe, then she's everyone's grandma. That's kind of yeah, how that's that like grandma to everybody. <laughs> Uh, let's see what is it's Michael Dark this and Junk and, and I, say, I was told yeah <laughs> I was totally expecting 
And I don't know why, because I'd never seen this movie. I'd never even heard of it. I mean, I, we talked about the title of it. I totally thought it was going to be Country Bears related. So I was way taken off guard when I saw it wasn't a bunch of rednecks with uh, j- like jaw harps and jugs. <laughs> well, yeah. The, the, have you seen the uh, live action Country Bear movie from about this time? That might be what you're mixing up with. Because a year before this, there is the live action one. We need to we need to get into them. We we need to figure out a way to get into this. Yeah, no, I've I've actually I uh, my film podcast. I chose the Country Bears live action as my birthday pick last year. Um, <laughs> the thing of that movie is it's really good, but the music actually blows for the most part. Like it's like modern country, or they're trying to get some pop engine into the mainstream, right? But then the rest of the movie is like great. Christopher Walken's great in it. The script is funny. I mean, yeah, I, I do recommend that movie. Um, this movie looks better. Brother Bear looks better. Although the animatronics and the country bears are quite cool. I mean, the the attraction in the movie. Um, but yeah, I actually kind of maybe if I want to watch some weird bears, I'll, I'll watch that instead of Brother Bear again, you know? <laughs> but speaking of music, this one, I don't even think it made an impact. I don't know if it wasn't, I wasn't paying close enough attention. Phil's but back. It, it didn't really have any breakout songs for me in particular. Especially Not if they were trying to match Lion King. Well, the, I mean, does it match Tarzan? I guess is the question, right? Which, nah, oh, right. I don't yeah, know. right, because yeah. it was Elton John, Lion King, right? Yeah, so this is them bringing old Phil back because maybe he didn't have anything else to do. I don't know. Um, and, and in, another, in, in this context, it doesn't even hold like a candle's fart to Lion <laughs> King and Elton John. No, no, but um, yeah, because he was like, well, he didn't. He was like, I don't know how to write songs that I'm not singing. Because in Tarzan, if you remember, nobody sings. But this one was going to, you know, have more singing. But he was like, I, I can't write songs that I'm not going to sing myself. Which, I mean, not as an ego thing, just like the style that I write songs and like other people, it doesn't fit their singing style, you know. So they got Tina Turner for the opener, uh, which isn't she doesn't sound the same as Phil Collins. Like, I guess it works. I mean, none of it really works that well because I can't hum any of these tunes. Let's see, what were the songs? Uh, music. Da-da. The Blind Boys of Alabama did some singing. Well, there, there's also a part of this movie that I and th- this might get a little bit ranty, and I'll and I'll keep it contained into segments so it doesn't turn into just one full blown rant. But I think also why this wouldn't be able to hold a candle to Lion King outside of the soundtrack, which I do think is vital. But that in the Lion King, you never had to make a a decision or a judgment call between humans and animals you got to operate within the animal kingdom and then decide who you thought was going to be the good guys and bad guys and your favorite characters and everything and anytime that we've got a disney movie maybe aside from tarzan because tarzan does such a great job of kind of intertwining but you almost have to make like a decision over whose side you're on and i think in this movie in particular they do maybe a good slash bad job of that yeah, I'm looking at the song titles it's like Great Spirit, No Way Out, Transformation. I can't remember what any of those sound like. And I, I watched it for the second time last night. You know, you'd think one of those would, would stick by now. But yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I've never been that into Collins anyway. So, um, you know, something interesting. We did Home in the Range already, which was going to come out first. And they flipped them because... To promote Brother Bear on the Lion King DVD or VHS or whatever was coming out in 2003. So they they specifically wanted to put this on with the Lion King. So it came out first, which I, I guess that makes sense. But that might have rushed this one a touch. Um, yeah, they were really banking on it to get a little bit of crossover. And who's to say that it didn't work? It might not have worked uh, incredibly well domestically as they were hoping, but it probably contributed to it, it being profitable, period, right? Yeah, but disappointing, profitable, you know, like nobody was like, wow, that worked. You know, this is the kind of thing where they uh, five years later, they would want to make an attraction at <laughs> the parks out of it, that sort of thing. This is one of the three movies, the last of the three movies that were uh, mostly produced in Orlando. So uh, this, well, this was yeah, in their backyard. This, this was before. Yeah, this was before I, I had my hand in anything or at least whatever they did for this one. Maybe it was just like VO or something. A, a lot of the times. Orlando would get staff with doing the editing and the the VO and a, especially a lot of remote VO where someone would they used to have like a special 
uh, tech. Like they wouldn't use the internet. It did like a phone line thing, but it wasn't like a phone line modem. But anyways, they would use one of these to do a lot of the the ADR, the dialogue. You're talking like in 2011 or something, right? Uh, correct. Yeah, because I was there from 06 to 2016. Okay. So oh, I got you. I got right in the middle. What do you know? But yeah, this was primary. This one was the last one primarily made there. Like they're doing the main animation at the uh, at the time, the MGM Disney Disney MGM Studios. Yes. So. So uh, this one, too, I think uh, it's a little bit interesting because I don't recall. And I guess related to that Disney proxy thing, but I don't recall a lot of other movies where they explicitly kind of have you uh, have to question morality on such like a deep philosophical level to kids essentially. Right. Uh, and it, it doesn't fit into the normal mold for this. So part of my thinking is brings me back to Disney's real play here. Just like for a while, I don't know if it's still true, but, but there was this concept that McDonald's might not have cared how much burger they sold if they could put the store in like a really good location because part of the business model was also just flipping real estate, just like owning and developing certain areas that were high traffic and then flipping those. So anyways, there could be something beyond just what's our domestic profit on this movie when it comes to Disney, especially if you believe like I do that they are totally in charge of weaponizing nostalgia and that they're playing like this Fabian society long game where they're planting seeds in your kids and your grandkids. And they might not necessarily care as much now about extracting money directly from your pocket in the short term. Obviously, there's board members and there's people where it's their job <clears throat> to make sure it's profitable day to day. But I think almost as an aggregor, as this like this entity that lives outside the boardroom that is now this Disney universe thing. Um, it needs almost to collect all the Pokemon, and this is its chance to collect that Northern Pacific uh, prehistoric Pokemon, like the ultra rare one, just so now it's in its basket, essentially. It's in its little Pokemon ball. So now for the next hundred years, for the next century or two, they've got this developed in IP. They got a character from this region and this time period, and that's part of what I think is going to make Disney work over the even longer time is that they'll have a story that it's like, oh, you're from the the Inglet tribe or whatever from uh, and your your family dates back to 14,000 years or whatever. We actually have a movie about you. They'll be able to say that to every tiny little demographic, even if it's only 14,000 people on the planet or something. So I, I don't know. I feel like this is a, a reach and that sort of a dynamic for them. When, when do you think this one will reappear as a quote unquote live action movie? I mean, they're going to have to start trailing the barrel before too long, or will they remake a live action beauty and the beast again before they do this one? You know, what do you think? <laughs> I, um, man, I'm really counting maybe not in our lifetime or maybe it will be, but it'll be a long time kind of blood and honey, but less D horror movie and more like B uh, like adult remake. Like I would love to see uh, an accurate remake of some of these movies, you know, Tarzan or um, Beauty and the Beast, where it kind of follows like not not the grim fairy tale uh, directly, because even those were kind of over the top, but just like playing it out. Do you remember there was a show Beauty and the Beast in the late eighties? Yeah, early 90s? It had Linda ha Linda Hamilton was correct. In it. Yeah, and, exactly. And Ron, was it Ron Perlman was the Beast? Some, it something might, like that. Dude, it might have been Ron Perlman. <laughs> and I'm not uh, saying that that one was that. perfect, but I would love to see a theatrical, well produced, like heavily budgeted version of that kind of a movie as Beauty and the Beast and Lion King and kind of all of these franchise man it's hard to, okay there we go it's, i finally found it was like 10 down because it was just called Disney beast is, right I, I don't think ron perlman geez i hate it when my memory is that sharp okay for <laughs> dumb things that don't matter no i do remember because that was syndicated and that was one of the shows i didn't like so much because it's in contrast to the shows i liked better like um you know the next generation of course is the gold standard in 1990 or whatever so. right well, yeah. well that one was like very cheesy soap opera y uh mm. like it was basically a soap opera beauty and the beast and it didn't have any of the the ass like the darker aspects of it or not as many it was like yeah. cats a little bit it actually reminded me <laughs> there was a children's show around that time called zubilee zoo that had a really weird 
God, nightmare fuel. God. It's very nightmare <laughs> fuel, but I don't know what it was, but that freaking show was just always on the channels and the time slots that I happen to be awake at wherever I was at. So I got more than my share of Zoobly Zoo growing up, which might explain some things. <laughs> right. Um, no, maybe maybe the re- Brother Bear 2, it's not the animated sequel. It's, it's the Revenant. That's that's Brother Bear 2. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's a great way to phrase it. Yeah, that's the remake is the Revenant. <laughs> Uh, of course, that's more like what uh, 19th century or something, is it? So time period's wrong, but uh, yeah. You throw there, a woolly you... mammoth in there and you smooth a lot over. <clears throat> so the criticism I'm going to come out with this movie, uh, just just as far as critically, is it just feels super tired. Do you get what I'm saying there? The music, Phil Collins sounds tired. Maybe he left. He did all his energy on Tarzan, and now he's getting older. You know tired and the one that got me i'm a big sctv fan so we got dave thomas and rick moranis here doing the moose um and they're doing their shtick from sctv as uh the mckenzie brothers but they sound kind of tired doing it and r- this is rick moranis's last role basically i think in the past two years he started thinking of doing stuff again but you know he did his last live action in 97 and then 2003 he's finished doing voice acting and yeah he's out and ironically that's probably the most like energetic entertaining part of the whole movie if you can get over like oh my god this is such a deep moral and philosophical revelation thank thank you disney for showing me these deep concepts but really like the moose just telling jokes and saying hey hey just doing that over and over that was kind of the highlight of the movie if it was if it was more a and less of whatever the hell like moralistic teachings we were getting it would have been better for me at least see for me i'm just like i want to watch sctv now right that's that's what it makes me think so uh, which <laughs> is it a commercial for sctv i don't know i guess it's how they wanted to get um uh, they wanted to get Cheech and Chong for one of the movies. We talked about it. Like now, I can't remember, but this is maybe that that line of thinking. Just get the comedy duo in as your uh, comic relief. You know, I like it. I think it's a good thought, and I think that it it added a little bit of what this movie needed. Now, now on the same time, yeah, you're like it's it's a little bit tired. The point I was making, the even like the most energetic part to me, well, if that was them tired, then like the rest of the movie was definitely uh, not going to be incredibly entertaining i guess for a regular viewer that's a I, I think that this is one of the deeper and more important disney movies like if you were to just put it on paper and just describe like i think this actually teaches an interesting perspective that we haven't seen in any other disney movie it actually forces um almost in a fern gully way but now instead of this ambiguous well you're going to chop down the forest and where are we going to live now it's like no like you kill them all like you, you human killed my mom and I'm a bear. And now you have to kind of explain that to me. And he does to his face and he cries and there's music. Like all of that is pretty heavy. Like I, I didn't see this as an eight year old, obviously I was, uh, I was working at Disney when this came out. Right. But if I had seen this as a kid, I could definitely see this as being not just traumatizing, but maybe in a calculated way on Disney's behalf. Uh, I'd be like anti-human a little bit or uh, anti-civilization a little bit more. Maybe that's it. Cause I was sitting there. Well, it's, it's not a, it's not a food thing cause they weren't going to eat the bears. They're not trying to make you just feel bad because of that, but it is self-preservation. That's a weird thing. Like the animations in this is great music, not so great, but the animation is, you know, full standard, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, at this point, Disney has raised the bar and they, they don't necessarily like lower it. But sometimes they just plateau. Sometimes they phone it in a little bit because uh, it's almost like, I don't know, uh, I got a lot of bad analogies, but it's like when a company owns a monopoly over a certain technology, they'll just release some BS product every year just so that they've got a new schlock to kind of sell every year, right? Uh, as opposed to, well, Yeah, you can fill in the blank with so many other versions <laughs> of this, right? But this is kind of Disney's version of that where... Maybe they don't have to innovate. Maybe they don't have to raise the bar and develop new technology every time. Um, so this one feels a little bit of that, like riding on their own coattails. Maybe also in one of those meetings, someone like me was like, hey, do you guys ever notice that whenever you think you've got the A movie, it's really the B movie? And whenever you got the B movie, it's the A. Like, maybe you guys don't know what you're doing. Maybe the next time you think there's an A movie, you should call it the B movie. You know, like maybe someone did like a reverso 
psychology thing and it just it didn't work <laughs> what's this and home on the range which one's the a and which one's the b you know? home on the range is the is the b plus i guess <laughs> right yeah. is that what you're is that what you're thinking too or is there a clear winner out of the two no i'm thinking there's not a clear winner out of the two um but this one had a lot more potential like you said that there's lots of interesting themes here it's doing something a little different it's kind of like a marathon runner that's went in the race and collapses you know 10 yards from the finish line but it's your fault that it did that and you need to think about it. That's right. <laughs> you killed it. Um, <laughs> well, I, I want to talk about shamanism. Uh, how do you want to view that one? Uh, I did think we s- recently saw a very similar shaman sort of thing in a uh, Mononoke. I mean, different lens, of course, but the wise old lady of the, uh, of the tribe is kind of exiling. Cause she knows that, uh, Keen eyes turned into a bear and then he has to go be a bear now. So it's, it's a little bit similar and not an okay. It's a demon arm. And in here you're a bear now. I don't know. <laughs> and, and she doesn't even miss a beat. She knows that it's keen eye the entire time, like pre bear after bear and just kind of like lives life as if everything else were incredibly normal. Uh, also though, it's, I mean, you can play this card, right? Like, well, I'm the shaman and I've got this wisdom, so I couldn't tell your brothers what had happened because you're all going through this learning experience together, right? But she, at any point, could have uh, talked to the the brother, right? Danahi, and been like, oh, by the way, <laughs> by the Don't way, your brother that, that you're looking for, he's a bear now. He's right there. That's That's him. That's the bear. If you need to talk, I can communicate through you two. But apparently she doesn't do that. Shamans tend to be... Uh, very fickle and mysterious in their ways, which uh, I'll I'll save this rant for a little bit later into the the topic here. But it it almost feels that it's like this infantilized uh, aspect of it, where oh well, it, they're just special. They're just really special. You just got to let them do their thing. Uh, in in terms of like letting the shaman not fall under the same scrutiny as anyone else in any other sort of scenario here. If you were going to a therapist. Um, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a religious figure in any other form of society outside of like the shamans, right? You might have friends and family that's like, I don't know about that advice. It doesn't actually sound like that makes a lot of sense. Are you sure this person, did you get a second opinion? I almost feel that there's n- there's no real way to get a second opinion in the world of shamanism without completely disrespecting like your shaman and their ancestors and your ancestors and it probably starts like this whole thing. And uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't like it. You don't trust your local shaman. Yeah. Can you shop around for your local shamans or is that it? And like, well, you shop around for a guru, I guess, if you're into that, (laughs) I feel like that's different though, because you move towards your guru. Your shaman is kind of like the one that opens shop. It's like, if you, if your local CVS just sucks or your seven 11, I think you got those, right? If you're, yeah, yeah. if your seven 11 sucks, which it probably doesn't, if it's in Japan, it's probably awesome. No, it's but awesome. if yours just happens to suck, that's the one you're stuck with unless you move. But most people don't move to get to a better seven 11, unless they just really need whatever's at seven 11. Yeah. Well, the seven 11 next to my house closed a few years ago. That was a bummer. So now I have to walk up a hill to get to the other seven 11. They're really close. So the owner was like, which one's more profitable and closed the lesser one, which one. And they serve the like, like uh lobster and, and rare filet mignon and like sushi and sushi. Yeah. Um, oh, no, the thing. Those are American things. rice bowls. You can eat some good stuff. Yeah. Then you can eat some perfectly decent food out of a Japanese seven 11, which I don't remember being the case in the States. So, <laughs> there's another connection here too to interesting shaman notes and they make a point that there's caribou here it's like oh my god caribou and caribou are basically just reindeer from my understanding is that the, the only difference between caribou and reindeer is what uh hemisphere you're in that you're using like the, the different terminology but they're effectively like the same animal and that's one of my favorite shaman stories the shaman uh, reindeer Tibet where they they saw reindeer eating these mushrooms and acting weird and then maybe one of them would pee and another reindeer would eat the pee and they would act weird so one of the shamans like let me go and eat some of that reindeer pee and then they start tripping and then we get Christmas there's a few <laughs> dots between those but that's that's kind of how it works they went for the pee wouldn't you go for the mushroom 
Well, you would, except the mushroom, if you eat it directly, you get sick. So you only get that uh, desired state after a lot of violent vomiting and a horrible, not great feeling. Lots of stomach cramps and nausea. But they've, they've figured out if they ate the pea, you know, if you do eat the yellow snow, screw you, Frank Zappa. <laughs> then now, all of a sudden, they get the inebriation, they get the hallucinations, they get all of the desired effects, and none of the sickness and the nausea and the vomiting. And then one of them was smart enough. It was like, wait a minute, we don't even have to drink reindeer pee. You can just drink my pee. Here you Ooh. go, 50 cents a cup. I think like <laughs> the Siberian shaman were one of the first to set up lemonade stands for that reason, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I had a witty thing I was going to say and forgot what it was. Too bad. Uh, mushrooms, good shit. That's a Bill Hicks bit. Yeah. Eat the mushrooms. That's good shit. Um, <laughs> this is pee, of course. Uh, caps. Christmas, Merry Christmas. There we go. Okay. <laughs> but of course, that's a very different strain, I guess, as well, you know? Um, oh, yeah, I was just going to go Zappa and Narc. That's what I was going to do. There we go. <laughs> was Zappa and Narc? He was full in Laurel Canyon, you know? Uh, pro- I don't know if he's specifically, he was, I'm going to say he's pretty much definitely in cahoots with the, uh, the structure of things, you know? He's straight laced dude being as weird as possible, hating the hippies. I, that, that He's an interesting Laurel Canyon strain, uh, if, if you want to look into that. I mean, that said, I, there's a couple of Frank Zappa albums I love, but, you know, you look at the history, and you're like, yeah, I, I think he was uh, up to something. What did he know? What did he know? Well, it's kind of like, you know, like the Grateful Dead, the idea of the Grateful Dead just being like basically uh, FBI or CIA assets, right? You know, spreading, spreading psychedelics across the land. Uh, my take on that is all of these bands, like the Birds or the Grateful Dead, probably had one ringer, you know, one guy that was fully in cahoots with the with the system. And the other guys are just there jamming, you know. That's kind of my take. Like the Birds, David Crosby had so much seediness on him, and the other guys actually do seem like they're just playing in a band and happen to be at the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. And it depends how your uh, your fame trip goes, I guess. Well, I, actually, the, I've got a good weave to to bring us back here too, but I mean. Out of all the things the CIA has done and could do, I would say giving you access to psychedelics might be one of the cooler things that they've done. If if all things being <laughs> equal, there's a lot of things that they could do to you that would be way uncool, way way yes. less cool than <laughs> yes. access to uh, psilocybin and salvia and LSD and fill in the blank, right? Um, right. So <laughs> if, if anyone's listening out there, CIA agents are listening, if if you're looking for someone to experiment on one of your many projects, uh, wittingly or unwittingly, I'd rather do the psychedelic ones and not any of the other ones that I've read about because all the other ones sound kind of horrible. I will be a psychedelic Johnny Appleseed. Yes, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I can so, handle that role. So, and and the weave that I've got here too is that, I mean, in some regards, that proliferation of psychedelics kind of was the final blow to sh- the whole concept of a shaman. Uh, at least now, most people that I that I know, like regular, I get such a charge word, but like all the normal people that I know, which I guess is none, um, their version of a, a, like an actual shaman, usually it's booking a flight and a hotel and going to like Peru or something and do one of those ayahuasca retreats. And that's sort of like the acceptable version of that. But it's also like flooded with just, you know, business like real estate agents from Vegas meeting up with a uh, high end luxury horsehair mattress salesman from Norway. And like they're they're all the ones that are going into these, you know, shaman retreats and stuff, which kind of proves the point a little bit that it's been so commoditized at this point that having a local shaman is kind of completely irrelevant now. Like you you might go and go to like the one almost like if you were finding a guru if you truly saw it as a life-changing experience that can solve some problem for you open new doors then yeah maybe you might shop around and fly halfway across the world in order to do one of these retreats or whatever but up until these were readily accessible um you would have to like go out like you were forced to go out and do like some long seeking adventure so i don't know pros and cons i I like that now you can just go to the the, the corner store in the near future, you'll probably be able to get any psychedelic you want, right? But you can go to the corner store in a lot of states now and get yourself a hallucinogen that used to be somewhat sacred. You'd have to go up to like the Himalayas or the Afghani region or something. 
Not in Japan. <laughs> no, Japan. Yeah, Japan keeps moving in the uh, no. Japan keeps moving in the other direction. They're just bearing their heels down. Uh, just last week, um, smoking marijuana became illegal in Japan. Like last week. Before that, it was only possession that was illegal. The actual act of smoking it was not, but they've now changed that law. Well, how do you smoke it without possessing it? Would you have to like light it on fire and stand next to it and just kind of like and <laughs> hail it as it right? Because if you hold it, the second you hold it, you're possessing it. Well, that's the, that's the point. The law isn't doesn't even matter, does it? But they still felt the need <laughs> right. to make it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and it's America's fault. Actually, you you could get stuff in, like, Japanese drugstores uh, up until after the war. And MacArthur made it illegal in Japan. But the thing is, once, you know, Japan never changes anything. So it's just, like, uh, very slow. Uh, there, there's loopholes that always get closed and someone else finds one. But, uh, yeah, that that's one thing. If you if you want to live in Japan, you uh, that's that's something you have to give up i guess hey that's one of the reasons i got more into meditation i was like well i guess i need to look for that um you know um what's it called in your brain <laughs> the oh my god why can't i remember the name of the dmg the, pineal thank gland. you yes thank you <laughs> so honestly that that's why i started doing meditation i was like oh maybe i can access that you know which i guess i did to a certain degree so it worked become your own shaman is, is always a good advice if you can manage it you know well, and there's also when it when it comes to psychedelics and shamanism in the Eastern world, I guess, and you could probably correct me on some of this because I'm just a Westerner talking based on what other Westerners have, you know, uh, wrote essentially. But my understanding was that one of the tenets of Buddhism was that Buddha eats a mushroom and dies from it, and because of that, there's certain sects of Buddhism that even to this day kind of ban mushrooms. Like you're not even allowed to come across them you definitely can't eat them like the mushrooms are just off the menu indefinitely but the story might have been that uh buddha originally knew what this certain type of psychedelic mushroom was and used it and he went somewhere and someone went to prepare him one of these mushrooms but they didn't know the difference and they gave him the poisonous version of this uh basically instead of giving him an amanita they gave him you know like a like a poisonous version that looked identical to it and it killed him and that that's turned it into this taboo where it's like, well, this thing killed the Buddha. So now no one's allowed to have mushrooms forever and ever and ever. And it still has like a pretty harsh taboo in the East versus in the West where most people are just ignorant of it. Japan loves mushrooms. Uh, you can pay tons of money for like, you know, like uh, you can go out and pay a hundred bucks for like a, just a thing of mushrooms that were like specially grown on a certain mountain or something. So uh, that particular taboo did not make it to Japan uh, parts in India or whatever. Don't know that that could be the case, but no, Japan loves mushrooms. I got a mushroom mountain, not far from here where you can buy expensive mushrooms or if that's I guess, awesome. you know, I love expensive mushrooms. Yeah. Mastake. That's, that's, that's our local uh, one that said, I don't like mushrooms that much, but <laughs> I don't put well, them do you on have any shaman. Though. Do you have any local shaman? Probably. <laughs> what, do I you, personally you, know them? Well, what do you think the local shaman would would be up to? Maybe hike in the hills and finding those uh, particular shrooms of uh, you know fun psychedelicness or something. Um, I'm trying to think. What what do we have? Uh, so there's a lot of Chinese medicine stores. Uh, that that's something you don't see much in the states. That's not not shamanism. I'm just looking for other things that would be inching in. Um, you know, the, like the thing is, there's a temple or a shrine in Japan. It's not like, it's not quite denominations and it's not quite the same. So you're going to find some places, like a, sh a very Shinto shrine, the priest there might be a little more along the lines of a shaman. Where if you find a very Zen Buddhism one, they're going to be a Zen Buddhist and probably not like much of a, more of a, more of a guru type or not, or a Zen type, right? You know, doing the ink and circles and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd be like, that's cool and everything. I like the circles, but like, where's the mushrooms at? Bring out the mushrooms. <laughs> right. So you'd be going to the Shinto ones. Um, one, when I go to a temple or shrine, because I, I do little meditations at temples and shrines. And, uh, you know, usually no, there's nobody there. Right. Or uh, but I do find the more red in the shrine, often the more kind of Shinto it is. It, it's a sliding scale, right? It's like this much shinto this much buddhist it's it's all together but you can find places that like kind of push a little more this way or push a little more in the other direction 
Although it's, it's, and it's greatly just a style, an architecture thing because you're just showing up by yourself, right? So um, <clears throat> the way it works is there's a big temple. So in Nagano City here, we have Zenkoji. It is the, actually, it's the home of Zen Buddhism, like in Japan. It's the main Zen Buddhist temple in Japan. As you go around, probably a couple hundred kilometers around, you're going to find similar smaller looking temples and shrines. So it's like a McDonald's. That's the head office. And then these are all the, you know, the franchises. Whereas I used to live in Tsunomiya where they had a very different looking shrine. And around there you would find shrines like that. But you'll find areas where you'll, you know, there's like five different kinds because they're all the circles are are overlapping. So and it's not really necessary to know which one's which, but well, I guess it makes sense too that um, Japan would have a bunch of, I guess, equivalent shaman. Because one of the other big factors in being a shaman is having some kind of communion with nature, like one that a, a normal Joe Schmo wouldn't have. And that's part of the reason that you go to consult the shaman is because of nature, right? So typically, if you're out in like the mountains, I guess, does that mean that shaman have no place in the city at all? Like, what if you're just concrete jungle only i wonder if that precludes you from being a shaman yeah but maybe that's one of the reasons in japan there's like little enclaves of nature even in the middle of tokyo you know you can find like a little park or a quiet street with some trees or something because uh when you see tokyo they show you shibuya crossing which is insane but you could take a five minute walk from there and be in a very quiet place and even find some trees well, I guess even New York City's got Central Park, but there's also areas that don't have a five-minute walk uh, to a park. And, I, and and that's one of the themes of this movie, too. And this, I guess, uh, continued part of my rant or just warming up a little bit. <laughs> but this is this Disney theme that I guess is pretty big in the 90s and gets uh, even bigger in like the 2000s and forward. And I kind of think that it might be a side effect of like critical theory without getting like too all political and everything in the weeds, but the critical theory is essentially just always fine. I'm going to reduce it to a biased uh, point of view here. The critical theory is kind of about always criticizing everything, always not necessarily solutions, just pointing out all the problems around you constantly in hopes that someone else will fix it. Like if I just annoy everyone else about all the problems and something, then do better. You know what I mean? Like, Matt, do better. <laughs> like, I mean, here's all the things you're not doing great. Do better. No, no other feedback. And part of that critical theory that you get from the Fern Gully and the Wally, which I'm excited to kind of get into too. But even in in um, Brother Bear, in one of the lyrics, and it might be like the talking section of the lyric, but they make this uh, certain claim about humans living side by side, like it, like it kind of ought to be, right? And it's sort of a song that is written in the future looking back at this present day 14,000 years ago about how great everything is and they're almost comparing it to modern times like hey before humans screw everything up look at how great this is but then the rest of the movie goes to show you how at any given point you're just going to be killed by a bear <laughs> and uh, you're going to then kill that bear it's just like an endless cycle of suffering and then the underlying story, though, according to that opening song, or it's like, this is how things should be. This is when things were better. You might get killed by a bear today. Okay, so when I woke up this morning, I had your email, you know, confirming this recording. And above that was one of those, like, Quora things that just show up in your box. And, and the question was, like, uh, could you survive 10 minutes in a locked room with a gorilla? Uh, you have a kitchen knife and something else. Uh, the first point, of course, was don't use the kitchen knife because that's instantly going to kill you. I think they were basically, like, crawl into the corner, bundle up, don't make eye contact. That's that's not living with nature. That's cowering with nature, right? Right, right. And... So, and I guess the, the whole crux of this whole concept of the rant is about this weird romanticizing of being natural. And I think that it's just an, another logical fallacy, just like almost anything else, where just because something's more natural never makes it inherently better or more ethical or more moral or anything. Uh, it's just it's just from nature, right? Nature and maybe this is biased, but I feel like it's sci like it's scientifically biased, but that nature doesn't care about you. Like nature doesn't have ethics or morals, right? It's, it, I don't know if it's transcendent or adjacent to, but it does not operate on any other source of justice. Like people 
try to kind of uh, organize their societies and their cultures around. Nature doesn't abide by any of that. Um, things can just happen on a whim. Hurricanes can happen, tornadoes and earthquakes. And like, there's no, absolutely no morality in that unless you start, well, you know, God did it. Everyone was acting, you know, way, how God didn't want them to. So he made the earthquake happen. But the nature itself doesn't really have any of those kind of uh, qualities, I guess. And maybe I'm talking from a modern American perspective and not from like an ancient, because I know some of the ancients really did believe some of this. And it's like, oh, we've got to go and sacrifice our kids because nature's angry at us again. But I think if you you eliminate that aspect of it, uh, it's kind of like this weird fallacy that people like to cite constantly, but is it's so uh, incomprehensible, it's incompatible, and it feels almost like this genuine for when this becomes one of the Aesop fable style morals of a story where the whole base of this movie in some way is like, okay, we're going to take a look back at when humans live side by side in nature back when things were better before humans screwed everything up. And I don't know. I don't know if, if there, there were any better back then or now or anything. It's, it almost feels like it's all just been um, sort of lateral movement. Yeah, I mean that's why it's a there's the force of nature. It's a for, you, I guess respecting nature is the important thing. Um, just a force Maybe. for good. Na- nature's not like, necessarily going to be a force for good. So, uh, respecting its power, you know, respecting the power of nature. I'm not talking as in like uh, necessarily an environmental thing. Although you know, do that too if you want. But uh, respecting the power of nature that you know you don't just like poke at nature in this movie they're they're i mean they are actively hunting mama bear but that's after the incident with the the basket so the mistake in this movie is keen not hanging up that basket if he had done that there there nothing would have happened in this whole movie so if, if we're going to find the actual fault the actual problem it's him not securing those salmon <laughs> maybe but i mean really the the crux <laughs> sure that <laughs> valid point but i mean yeah the crux is man versus nature in this movie they kind of explicitly state that but uh, another example of that right um like you were saying the connection or the respect i guess more in particular so if you were to compare say factory farming where no one has a direct connection, at least the consumers of the like the guy that eats the hot dog doesn't have a personal connection to any of the animals that went into making that hot dog. So he might not necessarily be able to worship the animal uh, while it's alive. And in fact, the animal is probably in a factory farm. It probably lives in like a little tiny closet that it can't turn around and all this, right? Like it's just like got another cow's ass in its face the whole time or pig or whatever goes into it. The beef lips and the, and the pig anuses and everything. Right. Um, so yeah, so maybe there's no personal connection there, but in a, in a, Thick devil's advocate way, right? There's another practice, and this wouldn't be from the the Northern Pacific, but if you were to go on some of the other Native Americans, um, they also kind of get the the naturalized treatment, like oh, everything they did was fine because it was natural, and they did these things called buffalo jumps, and it's where they would work up a frenzy of buffalo, and they would cause them to jump over a cliff. They wouldn't have to hunt them; they would just corner them and force them to jump off a cliff. And these are some of the instances where they might actually have a lot of waste because there's that phrase of like, use every part of the Buffalo. This is from one of those uh, tribal areas. And that was because they did, they, they turned, you know, every aspect of the Buffalo and there was the Gary Larson far side. And it's like the guys holding up the weird little organ. They're like, this is the only part we don't use. We don't know what it's for or whatever. Um, but that premise is based on one of these tribes, but those Buffalo jumps sometimes result in such a large herd that some of the food would just completely go to waste. There was nothing to do with it because there just wasn't enough people to process it in the amount of time it would have taken without, you know, modern technology, refrigeration, everything. So this is an example of uh, even native American sort of like revered culture where they had incredible amounts of food waste. So now the, the difference is, well, they had a personal connection. They had personal respect. They honored the animals before and after. Maybe. What about the ones that just freaking straight up died and rotted under the sun? Like, they might have said their piece afterwards or something. So now let's say that it's like a humane version where they raise the animals and they go and they talk to them Disney style. And then at a certain point, then they have to jump them off. And they're like, look, this is just part of how life is. 
would you rather be killed by the person that has like loved and lived alongside you that has developed a friendship with you? Um, not a mercy killing. Like they just straight up one day, they're like, Matt, I'm going to eat you now. Like I'm hungry. <laughs> and you're like, what? We've been friends for years. What do you mean? We've lived like you, you'd be going through all these stairs. Like, what did I do wrong? How can I fix this? Or would you rather be killed by some nameless, faceless, you know, industrial, uh, like corporate nobody that's literally putting you out of your misery. Would you rather be removed from a, like a gleeful experience by a friend or put out of your misery by a stranger? I don't know. I, I don't even know if I can make the judgment call between those, but it feels like it's not the most obvious answer to me. I don't know. Uh, didn't Disney come up with their own solution in, in, in home on the range where it's like, here's this lady that runs a farm with no production. Then let's <laughs> just live there. <laughs> right. <laughs> And she so, lo- and she basically loses the farm because he's no longer running a business. Like that's not how you run a farm. So I feel like if you're posing that question, the next movie or the previous, it seems even in the Disney production schedule, we're not sure which one should be considered first and second. But uh, yeah, maybe somebody thought of that, and the answer was la 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 la. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I Here's- guess I guess the the whole point of that whole rant thing though is that this um, brother bear is one of those movies that does kind of put that critical theory thought in the heads of eight year olds. That's like, Hey, if you live in a city, Hey, if you're not, you know, if your family doesn't come from 14,000 years ago, if you're not hunting your own bear, then you you're part of the problem. And I don't know, I've, I've grown to think of this with a little bit more nuance. Uh, Maybe it's just like a defensive measure where like, I don't want to feel bad for all the animals that have lived in horrible conditions just to turn into like, a spicy chicken sandwich that I put in the microwave or something, right? I want to separate myself from all the pain and suffering that that might be causing down the line. But also, aren't hot dogs and chicken nuggets where they grind up like the festering chicken bones and all of like the slop parts on the ground and they bleach them and they squish them into a pink paste and they reconstitute them and deep fry them and give them to eight-year-olds? Isn't that a better version of using all the buffalo? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and um, American Disney, it's, it's all chicken fingers, isn't it? If you're eating there. <laughs> so I don't chicken know. I mean, I, all. I mean I, to, to be fair, if I had to kill my animal that if I want, you know, I had a not real nice hamburger on Friday, right? Mm-hmm. But if I had to kill the cow in order to have that hamburger, I might shy away from that. I mean, I'm talking, you know, me in my position now, if I grew up on a farm or that was just what we did, because that's what we had to do. Now you're used to it. Uh, I'm not used to that. I don't think you're used to it. My in-laws farm, but they don't have any animals. It's all veggies, you know? No, And it's funny that you should mention that. I mean, I I did grow up on a farm. We just didn't have uh, a whole lot of animals. We definitely didn't have a cow. My grandma also grew up on a farm. And when she was a little girl, she named one of the chickens. Like, did like you know, she was a little kid. She, like, fell in love with one of the chickens. It was, like, her pet. And it came time to slaughter the chicken. And her parents were like you live on a farm like this is what we do here and after that day she never ate chicken for the rest of her life she would prepare it she would cook i mean she was an italian grandma so there was no way that she wasn't going to be preparing chicken for everyone all the time but she never touched anything she made that had chicken in it uh and she would always say it was because like like she saw her best friend like she saw her her family kill her pet and eat it in front of her and it was like the most traumatic thing i guess so yeah some people are not cut out for it but also there's probably someone out there that's like i'll kill a cow but i don't want to sit in a room and talk into a microphone for three hours that's crazy you know what i mean i mean yeah i mean with the idea of taking the chicken slapping on the table and thwapping its head off that sounds kind of intense you know i mean it's used in movies to be kind of intense sometimes uh so yeah do i have the the cojones to go kill the food i'm eating no probably not so (laughs) Right. Well, and that's that's even like a factory agricultural version of that. But again, like if we're talking Native American tribes, particularly 14,000 years old, and we're going to romanticize it and say that's back when, you know, humans were really living in nature back when things should have been there. Um, I believe a lot of those tribes, too, like they didn't domesticate animals just for slaughter. So it was oh. it's it's apples and oranges, not even. Also, uh, maybe 14,000 years is a little farther back, but let's go back six, 700 years. Um, you know, these idyllic living with nature folks 
we're living in pretty urban societies, you know? We just showed up with some nasty diseases and walked through the apocalypse. So the cities had already <laughs> fallen apart once we got to them. Well, and and also, this is an interesting note when I was doing research on this that Tlingit tribe. Um, they from I guess dating back, I'll say 14,000 years, just because that's the context of the Disney movie. I don't know of how far back this particular tradition goes, but uh, they only recently in the last like century or two compared to 14,000 years um, abolished their own version of hereditary servitude, meaning that in that tribe, even I guess in the context of that Disney movie, if your dad was a slave to like the rich guy uh, on the edge of the tribe and then you were born like you're now the slave too, and your kid's going to be the slave and that kid's kid's going to be saved all the way up until uh, Alaska got integrated into the United States and they were like, no, 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 you can't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're all natural and everything's great. You, you got to keep, you got to keep, uh, like, you got to stop keeping all the slaves. No, I'm also looking at the timeline. Um, just since we're looking at such a, a past time, uh, if we consider what, when, when is the, uh, asteroid hit supposed to be? 10, oh, the driest? 1, yeah, 10,800. So we're looking pre that. I don't know. I just thought that was kind of like when I was just thinking right, about Right, because it, that, like, that apparently is part of what took out a lot of the woolly mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers. And because there's also a mention of saber-toothed tigers in this movie when the main character, Kenai, I think, he, he's expecting to be like this badass. And then he's like Love Bear. They basically tell him he's a Care Bear. Now I'm sitting here wondering when Ice Age came out, as in the movie Ice Age. It, it must have been around the same time. Uh, 2002, one year earlier. I wonder if this had any was in any way a response to that. I guess it would have been production earlier, and the original impetus was um, the Lion King. So maybe not. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I'm just sitting here thinking of Ice Age, which uh, and ramps up the cute factor with the animals. Of course, uh, this does some of it, especially once the bear's transformation occurs. But well, ag again, may, unless I'm totally rusty, but Ice Age doesn't really feature any humans in there. It has right. a little so, bit of humans. It, it shows them a little bit. We spend most of the time with the animals. But, I mean, here we actually do spend most of the time with the animals. One of them has just turned into a bear. Right. But, I my, I mean, I guess the fact that you know that it's really a human spirit in that bear changes it all. Like, it's a human mm. the whole time. Yeah, it's been quite a while since I've seen Ice Age. Are they delivering? Not delivering as in, like, pregnancy of baby. But I think they're moving a baby. Killed a stun. Da, 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 da. Tasked with bringing the baby of Soto alive. So they are moving a human baby in uh, Ice Age. So there's that human. That one's around for the whole movie, but it, it doesn't, you know, talk or right, communicate. Well, that's them the protecting the human that's essentially going to hunt them into extinction, too, right? <laughs> but the image I remember most around the movie is kind of the, um, you know, the, the tribe going off into the, you know, the, the icy wastelands at the end or whatever, and not so much the cute animals, so... Well, and and uh, and to I guess emphasize my earlier point too, like the whole critical aspect of it is that even at the end of Brother Bear, uh, Kenai gets transformed back into a person, but then he's like, "Humans suck. Make me a bear again," and they do it. And the end. Okay, uh, there is a Brother Bear two in which I think that is reversed yet again for uh, whatever. And he's reason. like, "Okay, actually, being a bear does suck. Let me go back to being a human again." Yeah, first there's a canceled television spinoff. So this does not have the show where I'm like, oh, wow, this happened. What do you know? Um, and it ends with Kina, Kina and Neat. Oh, he, he goes Jungle Book and meets a, a, a girl he likes, it seems. They should have come out with Kina and Kel. That would have killed. Do they fall in love while he's a bear? Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm just kind of like scanning over this, but uh, huh. Okay, uh, Mandy Moore doing the voice of of the girlfriend in that one. Okay, weird. Uh, anyway, there's a brother bear too, where they they I guess transform him back and forth a few other times, and it seems he eventually ends up human at the end. With probably wait, wait, wait. Trans the spirits transform Nita into a bear. It's all, this is all too confusing. Okay, that's that's where I'm coming down on. It's, it looks very confusing to go on to brother bear too. So it's good we don't do the direct to uh, DVD movies <laughs> yet. Right. <laughs> that could be a really depressing um, budget hole. Um, let's move on through your notes. Uh, I don't know what portion of the rant you are on currently, but. 
Uh, that was that was the final note in the rant, just because at the end of the movie, they they kind of reconfirms that um, that nature is better than civilization. The bears are better than humans in the context of this movie, and that I mean that kind of puts a, a huge exclamation point at the end of that statement. Well, I mean, I have a, a uh, one of the guys I podcast with is definitely going to support the bears in any movie. He's he loves bears. <laughs> Well, and even in the movie, though, you, you said that it was kind of Kenai's fault for leaving the fish out, right? But leaving the fish out, the bear comes and gets the fish. But there's also something that happens between those two things. When they find the bear eating the fish, they start throwing rocks at it. And at that point, it's like the bear already got the fish. Like, now what are you doing just throwing rocks at this thing? None of that was self defense. At that point, they actually trigger the bear. To then be like, well, hell, if you're throwing rocks at me, you're trying to hurt me, uh, I need to get out of this. So it attacks and then runs away and then they corner it. So it really is ultimately all humans that are causing the pain and the suffering in this particular context. Right. So it's still violent to not not respecting the power of nature, right? Nature is going to claw you and bite you if you throw rocks at it. Uh, what else? I did have some other ranty comments, but they're just not part of like a long tangential rant. But one of them is the uh, the shaman uh, Yanana, right? Was that was that her name? Am I getting the name right? Uh, that's real close. If it's not it, um, Tana- oh, Tanana, looking. Tanana. That sounds right. That's it. Yes. So Tanana makes this uh, note about like the spirits are what makes the moon change shape. Um, and I guess I'm just like, is this just an example of? Oh wow, that's really profound. But to me, it's just like anyone that's like, "Hey, what's your sign?" Oh, you know, Mercury's in retrograde, and that's why my cell connection keeps dropping. It almost feels like the same level of um, you're just making things up. (laughs) You're just saying things and and attributing them to like the moon and celestial movements uh, in place of actually understanding or describing what's happening. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm thinking I was going to mention this. Uh, we had to, of course, delay this a bit, but a week a, or a week and a half. I remember looking at the moon and being like, the moon looks brighter. That was kind of weird. Like for three nights in a row, maybe it was because it was a harvest moon or something. But I was like, the moon definitely looks brighter right now. And I didn't quite work that out. Sunspot activity. I don't know. <laughs> Have you? I'm a, I am know a lot of people that make this claim often but there's a like an idea that the sun is a different color than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago like the the sun itself is emitting a completely different color than it ever has before let me just look outside <laughs> but what but what are you basing it on like did have you memorized the color of the sun from <laughs> and you can actually different cuz to me it's just like it's the source of light I guess I've never really noticed uh, because you're not supposed to look at it directly for one, but also light is kind of just a a value scale of difference, right? Like light can't exist without dark and all that woo woo esoteric occult Disney stuff. But uh, it's not like light. Just I get, I mean, it can have a color inherently, but when we're talking about the source of all light, (laughs) right? Aside from like phosphorus, uh, you know, um, resources that, I don't know. Like, do you know what color the sun is? Can you compare it to 10 years ago? No, not really. I just wanted to see light. So I looked outside. Um, but that is a, like the, the moon thing. I'm just like, it just looks different. Maybe it's the clouds. I don't know why, but it, it definitely like there were like three nights in a row. I was like, the moon looks kind of different for some reason. Maybe someone can chime in with a wild theory as to why that may be. I think it's waning now. So there just isn't as much moon right now, but it it would be way cooler if uh if i knew like exactly what phase the moon was in at all times like I, I do think that would be a cool like party trick and maybe it would be helpful for humans but uh i don't know we had the farmers almanac for that and farmers haven't really had the best run over the last century so i don't know if uh if being in tune with nature is as important as it was 14,000 years ago 
I mean, I like to spend a lot of time outside. After this, I'm going to take one of my walks uh, at night. I'm walking home from work. And if it's not cloudy, I'm kind of tracking at least simple stuff. Where's Orion at this point in time? What phase is the moon in? If it's Even out, if I wanted know? to do that, there's so much light pollution in downtown Orlando that you're not even going to see the freaking stars. Right. When I lived in Atlanta, that would never be the case. And I'm not getting the best star view here. Um, I, I could drive off a little bit. We, we almost did that. My, my daughter got you know, an astronomy assignment. So first we, it was going to be cloudy. We were going to go to this outdoor observatory at night, but then it's going to be overcast. So no point in doing that. So we went to the planetariums where they stopped doing the part where they actually explain the, the nights that days or that night's sky. If you go to a planetarium, there's usually the first 10 or 15 minutes are just like, it's that boring thing. They show the, the city around the, the bottom of the planetarium and just tell you where things are going to be. Right. And they don't do that. They went straight to like a Tyrannosaurus Rex movie in a planetarium. I'm like, I came over the stars. Why am I looking at dinosaurs? Yeah, well, I mean, I, w- I wanted to make a like a, a bad joke of like planetary. I mean, the place where they put on the Pink Floyd laser light show things. I wish. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no, we went to the science museum and I was just bummed out. They changed the exhibits and they were all crappier. The planetarium didn't do the actual educational part. And it seemed dimmer than usual. They had a new projection machine and I didn't think it, it would seem crappier than the old one. So I was just angry at this science museum i quite enjoyed going to 10 years ago turned into crap <laughs> you know what happens though is they switch it back to like their normal schedule and then you just hear people like where's the dinosaur movie put on the yeah. dinosaurs right yeah that's what they want they want the dinosaurs and, yep. and kids don't care about the actual astronomy which honestly you do fall asleep during that but i fell asleep in the dinosaur <laughs> movie so <laughs> well see i guess that's part of the point here though is that you don't need astrology or astronomy or any of these things if you can just wish upon a star. So if you can just put on Pinocchio or what's the new dreams. one Wish, the new movie Wish from Disney, mm. you don't really have to understand all that. Like Disney understands that for you and they can distill the most important parts and bake them into uh, like the the motifs in the movies, right? Like that's kind of their role here is that they chew up the food for you and they spit it into your little baby bird mouth. <laughs> Let's look at Wish. Okay. Wish. I'm 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 just, whoa. Wish is this year or 2020 last year, yeah. I was just curious how successful because I remember hearing it was kind of a flop. And um it was kind of a flop, I guess, once you consider marketing. They spent almost two hundred million bucks on that movie. Wow. <laughs> That kind of bloom. I know animation costs. I I guess movies cost that much now, you know? That movie, I guess skipping ahead a little bit, because we're not going to get to it for quite a while, but uh, Wish is one of the most occult Disney movies I've ever seen in my entire life. So (laughs) there's a freaking uh, cliffhanger for you that'll be an episode in like a year and a half. Grand finale. Well, I guess we'll probably have several films after that by that point, but... It's um, it's basically just Alistair Crowley retold through a Disney movie. Okay, that sounds like fun. Well, yeah, last, I mean, there's so many dick, last dick. There, there's so many movies where I'm just like skipping it now, like just because like we're gonna get to it. So why bother watching any Pixar's I haven't seen? You know, we're, we'll get there eventually. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, let's see if I got anything else in my notes. Actually, I have not been looking at my notes, which I think is a good sign. Um, if I'm not looking at my notes, uh. Now your man was stuck in my head at some point. The Trey Parker song. I don't know why that is. Barry White and Luther Vandross probably got the love bear totem. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't have much um useful stuff here, but uh anything else you got? And then your oh, a couple notes. other um towards the very end of mine, a couple other ranty uh, notes, but I won't make it like super ranty, but um there's the scene where Kenai meets up with the little baby bear. I guess this is where brother bear kind of comes from. Like he kind of, they kind of form this brother relationship because the little bear, uh, and this is the one where you, the viewer who is Kenai, you're supposed to relate to Kenai protagonist. You killed this bear's mom and you know it. And you got to break it to him at a certain point. But one of those scenes when he goes and meets the rest of the bears, and this is kind of one of my the favorite scenes in the movie where he's like scared because all these big bears and they're fishing and they like come up and they're growling and stuff and he cowers. And then all of a sudden they're like, Hey, what are you afraid for? We're all, we're all friends here. Like we're just chilling out. Um, that doesn't happen. Uh, in fact, bears are one of the many examples of incredibly solitary creatures 
The only exception is that there's a bear that was literally like it lost its mom. Then they might allow that bear to hang out until it gets big enough to pose a threat. But there's this scene where they're all uh, in this river, you know, hunting salmon or whatever. And there's like six or seven adult bears that are all just like chilling, like one chick bear and stuff. That wouldn't happen. That that would like cause fights immediately. Also, I think they're trying to do like the elephant sort of scene, you know, something from again, a Lion King or Jungle Book hanging with the elephants. It's kind of but chill, I, I can right? believe that because because elephant elephants do have herds, but there really aren't bear herds. Like bears are incredibly solitary animals. And <laughs> the concept of like this brother bear thing, because there's like this one chick there too, but like the concept of this brother bear, um, bears also practice uh, infanticide. And it's interesting. It's it's a totally practical thing. So if you come across a young bear and you're an old bear, you're not like, hey, I'll take you under my wing. We'll hang out now. It'll kill the young bear because what happens is if, if there's a young bear there, then it also means that it might be nursing. And if the mom's nursing, then the mom won't necessarily go into heat. So now the mom is like not receptive to new gentleman bear collars, right? But if you kill the baby bear, then the bear practically stops suckling at the mom. And after the mom doesn't have a bear suckling, then it basically cuts. Um, like if, if it doesn't uh, go through the whole lactation process, then it immediately starts transitioning back into heat. So if you're a bear on the prowl and you're looking for some milf bears, you're killing every bear cub you see because you may, you basically need to whack them all down. It's like a whack-a-mole. And once you win the game of whack-a-mole, you get a hot bear that's like ready to go. So none of none of this happens. And the only reason I'm kind of ranting about it a little bit <laughs> is that again in Disney fashion, it's like, oh, all the bears go and they meet up and they have this cool like bear community and stuff. Because it would kind of ruin part of the premise of this movie if they show up and the other bears are like, nope, this is my river. And it kills them and then the movie ends. <laughs> well, that's why the Revenant's the sequel, right? right. Maul up uh, <laughs> old Leo there. <laughs> But uh, I guess we'll start winding this one down then. Uh, just as a weird note, this was the most widescreen animated film until the My Little Pony movie 14 years later. That's a weird fact. You think you'd want to do widescreen animation? I don't get it. <laughs> uh, I guess I've got a parting question. Maybe it's it's rhetorical, but I'll let you answer it if you've got a good answer to this. Like, I'll at least have a snarky one, I imagine. <laughs> what the hell was the lesson of this movie? Hmm. Okay. No, actually, that's a good question. I mean, that's not a snark one. Mm, what is the message of this movie? Because I, I, I did not. I mean, obviously, like you said, there's a little bit of a fern gully, you know, nature's right. better thing. But I don't think that's actually what it's going but, for, is it? But in fern gully, the the message is kind of like, hey, don't just mow down a rainforest, uh, to for industrial reasons. But in this one, is it don't kill a bear? Is Except that the changes in your life if you become a bear, just roll with it. I, get, I don't know. I mean, it, re it really feels so ambiguous. Like, I, f I feel like Disney, you're supposed to, like, spoon feed me some sort of Aesop morality fable. So I know how I have changed into a better person just from consuming your movie. And this one doesn't leave me with, like, a completed feeling in the same way. Like, it just leaves a bunch of weird, unresolved issues. Like, I guess we just got to kill bears. I guess all of life is suffering and there's no end to it. I mean, I guess the thing is Keen either was, he didn't have any particular problem. It's not like he had a character flaw he had to get over. I mean, he didn't love getting the love bear totem, but whatever. That's not really, I would have liked that. I think, well, but well, I think he, that... he messes up the basket. That's why I brought that up. Cause that's like kind of the worst thing he did. Well, well, I think his flaw was that he goes to seek revenge on this bear that kills Sitka. And that when he finally finds the bear, which ends up being the mom of, you know, his new like friend, I guess, but that that was an act of revenge more than it was an act of self-defense. But even that is arguable to me. It's like, I don't know, man, if, if, if you've shown that there's a bear that's coming to where we live and keep all of our family and food and everything. And now that bear sees this area as a food source, you've just like, it's created a new problem. And you want to make sure that that bear, it's, it's almost like an ant, right? If an ant finds sugar in your house and then it goes and tells the other ants and they come back, no, you want to like kill the messenger ant so it can't go back and tell the rest of the ants like, hey, there's food over here. Just like 
you would want to kill this bear so it doesn't think that this is now where it goes for food now because there's always going to be fish in a basket because now who else is going to be there in the way next time? I might take out, you know, the, the shaman grandma or something. So I don't know. Like that was originally what he did wrong was that he, he was seeking revenge and it wasn't just out of self-preservation or respect, I guess. I don't know. I guess that's that was leading to the question. Like, what the hell was the message of this movie? Well, the movie doesn't paint it as self-preservation. Like you said, I mean, in this part of Japan and north of here, sometimes bears start, you know, find a uh, village they want to hang out in and they've got to get rid of that bear, you know, uh, either tranking and taking it somewhere completely different, which is difficult in Japan because it's not that big a country or, um, you know, shooting it. This is almost the inverse of Jungle Book, specifically Jungle Jungle Book 2, where it's like the animals know that Mowgli coming would destroy everything that they got going on. Just like if a bear just shows up in your village, if Baloo shows up in the village, right? That's um, a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem now. Now they're going to kill Baloo. Yeah. So I, I, that is an interesting thing that the movie paints it as a revenge trip he's on, but it maybe it's because he's emotionally worked up about, but his brother did just get killed. So it's not, you know, again, it's not like a character flaw so much. He, he got carried away with a necessary task. Right. Yeah. I guess, I guess that's a good way of uh, phrasing this. So that there's no, to me, there's no discernible character flaw. So there's no real story arc where the character goes through this transform. Like in this one, he clearly goes through a transformative process, almost the emperor's new groove in a way. Right. Like you're going to turn to this animal so you can live through this new perspective and get a new appreciation for things. But that doesn't really happen the same way. In fact, he's like, hell, like I'll just stay a bear. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I'll, <laughs> I'll just stay a llama. Screw it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe being, may, maybe being an animal's fun. I don't know. I haven't been one. I mean, humans are animals, but. <laughs> and also the other, uh, the other live action remake of this movie you ever seen the documentary grizzly man i know of it but yeah that's the so that one wants to go. also doesn't end well and then that one it is a guy that is like trying to in the most altruistic way live side by side with nature and respect nature and commune with nature and nature communes the right the heck back with them right so that's not respecting the power of nature respecting nature and respecting the power of nature two different things uh, and you know there, there's one is self-preservation one is i guess nice so but yeah well, that wasn't um, nearly snarky enough to end this on no no well, it, was, <laughs> it, it, it turned out to be an actual point didn't it <laughs> that there's no uh as my my trekkie well, friends he, say there's no real message moral or meaning here it's just things happen and they're well, I, to I guess to, to the end of that point, though, the, the, the documentary Grizzly Man has a more obvious message than Brother Bear. Right. So in well, that, that case, I would almost suggest so. that you show your kids Grizzly Man instead of Brother Bear. Well, no one showed their kid Brother Bear anyway. That's why everyone's forgotten <laughs> this movie exists. <laughs> um, I mean, let's get, you know, I, I don't think there was ever any IP from this, like, after this i mean they made a direct to video sequel because i guess it was at least that successful and they could you know maybe sell it abroad right well that, honestly that's another really interesting uh point here though that i i guess not as interesting as a disney proxy but the disney sidekicks and ip that tend to develop better usually have some like over the top hyperbolic look to them or they're you know they they wear something crazy or there's like something visually it sets them apart. In this case, there's just bears. Yeah, because I think the only Disney that really caught on in the first few years of uh, the 21st century is Stitch, who does look insane, right? <laughs> this is just like a bear who's reasonably cute. This looks like a bear, home on the range. Nothing from that really stuck. Um, the Emperor's New Groove, nothing from that really stuck. Uh, you know, you could like those movies or not, but none of them had coattails. They, they came out, maybe had a sequel of some kind, and then just kind of gotten were forgotten about. So it's kind of, you know, it's the two thousands at Disney is just kind of a bland sea of technically proficient mediocrity to a certain degree. It seems that's why we're relying on Pixar so much. Like any good corporate, uh, you know, entity is. 
Right, right. Now, I will say when we get to the 2010s that some of the actual Disney movies I quite like, and we're, we will track how that happens. And uh, but but first, we have to watch Meet the Robinsons and Bolt. So, <laughs> well, and and again, if Disney is playing that Fabian Society way of of weaponizing nostalgia and owning every parts of every little culture and nook and cranny of the world, uh, just to amass cultural influence on on every single corner. Then yeah, you're gonna have to sit through <laughs> some brother bears every once in a while. <laughs> um, I guess we will end this one for today, though. But it's now October. Uh, how are you kicking over at the Paranoid American? We're actually kicking pretty damn good. I released a new set of conspiracy cards that have got like Alex Jones and Isaac Cappy and uh, like all all the big names, William Cooper. I've even got uh, Donald Ewan Cameron a bunch of CIA guys in there. Jolly West has got his own card and they're all themed after parody versions. Thank you very much. Fair use. I hope I think of <laughs> like upper deck and score and Fleer and tops cards from the late eighties and early nineties. The, the best designs ever Don Russ, uh, some of my favorite Don Russ 88 designs and stuff. So those, but it's all conspiracy theorists, legends. And I dropped them a week ago and they sold out and I ha- made another 50 packs or so, which is like another hundred cards. And then those sold out within like a day or two. So now maybe I'm just going to start doing conspiracy cards. That'll just be my whole thing. Hey, if it works, you know, you keep plugging. It's, it's always the thing you don't expect that's going to take off. Right. <laughs> well, I'm, and I'm happy to, cause this is something just like every other thing that I make. It's a thing that I wanted to exist. I was like, Oh, it would be cool. If this thing existed. If it does, I'll go out and I'll get some. And I looked for this and I was like, eh, it doesn't really exist the way that I'm seeing it. Like, I guess I got to be the one that makes it. So if it sounds interesting, you can go to conspiracycards.com and get yourself a pack. There we go. As for me, I'll be your shaman today. Get a pair of headphones and then the pod catchers. Look for binaural infinities where you'll get 25 minute long uh, binaural beats. Or you could go to rovingsagemedia.bandcamp.com where you will also see those as a binaural collection along with some rock and roll, psychedelic rock, folk rock, electronic music, and and such. So feeling the music plug today. I mean, hey, if I'm going to be some kind of shaman, it's going to be musically, I think, you know? Or or maybe maybe I have the voice from Dune and when I talk, it just profoundly affects people. Probably not. Well, you can't have Dune without Spice, right? It's no, yeah, the spice melange. That's what I want, right? Yeah, that's what we need. Some spice melange. Look, you're gonna have to move fast. Conspiracy cards from Paranoid American are here. Conspiracy cards from Paranoid American, a set of over 200 cards featuring legendary conspiracy theorists, cult leaders, esoteric secrets, and more. For more details, visit conspiracycards.com today. Paranoid. Scribble my life away, driven to write the page. Will it enlight your brain? Give you the flight, my plane, paper, the highs ablaze. Somewhat of an amazing feel when it's real, the real you will engage it. Your favorite, of course, the Lord of an arrangement. I gave you the proper results to hit the pavement. If they get emotional, hey, maybe your language, a game, how they playing it well without Lakers. Evade them, whatever the cost, they are the shape shift. Snakes get decapitated, met is the apex. Execution of flame, you out. 
nuclear bomb Distributed it war, rather gruesome for eyes to see Max them out, then I light my trees Blow it off in the face, you're despising me for what though? Calculated it rather cutthroat Paranoid American, must be all the blood smoke for real Lord, give me a day away, vacate They wait around to hate whatever they say Man, it's not in the least bit we get Heavy rotate when a beat hits So thank us, you're welcome Fuck the niggas for real, you're welcome They ain't never had a deal, you're welcome Man, they lacking appeal, you're welcome Yet they doing it still, you're welcome